Imagine a weapon so powerful that it can potentially kill everyone inside a hardened building or a cave without damaging the exterior. This might sound like science fiction, but it's actually a reality. Known as thermobaric weapons, these shocking munitions are the stuff of nightmares. With the ability to kill and injure people standing behind corners, inside caves, or in trenches, the weapons are indiscriminate in their reign of terror. And if you think that was bad enough, wait till you hear about a thermobaric bomb more powerful than the strongest American nuclear weapon. While it seems unbelievable that a weapon like thermobaric munitions can work, the idea behind them is pretty simple. When a normal bomb goes off, the explosive power is limited by various factors, including the weight, type of explosive, and distance from the target. Regular bombs' energy comes from the different chemicals used to make the explosives inside the warhead. And while there are thousands of ways on a molecular level to make explosives, there is one common element between them – oxygen. Oxygen is needed to fuel the explosion, which is naturally worked into the explosive during manufacturing. But thermobaric weapons turn this concept on its head. Whether one hears the terms thermobaric weapons, vacuum bombs, or fuel air explosives, these all mean the same thing. To be a thermobaric weapon, the ordinance has to create a two-part explosion. The first explosion is used to spread a highly flammable fuel around a particular area. And no, this is not like the fuel you'd want to put in your car. The fuel in thermobaric weapons is like solid-state fuel used in long-range rockets. Once this fuel becomes atomized in the initial explosion, the fuel becomes highly combustible when mixed with oxygen. As a result of using all the oxygen in the surrounding area to fuel the explosion, more oxygen from further away gets sucked into the blast zone thereby creating a massive pressure differential. The resulting shockwave, with its ability to bypass all types of cover and concealment by going over and through doors, hallways, tunnels, and trenches, creates the deadly vacuum, and hence why these weapons are informally known as vacuum bombs. Because the shockwave from thermobaric weapons can cause indiscriminate carnage to both military and civilians alike, and since there's no control over it once launched, it's a highly contentious weapon that some say should be banned from the battlefield. But just how many countries have these kinds of weapons, and how often are they employed in combat? The answer to that question will surely shock you. Thermobaric weapons have become increasingly popular over the years as the chemical process behind them becomes better understood. This is because developing these munitions is much more difficult than one might think and requires tons of trial and error using different kinds of fuel, deployment methods, and so on. But nowadays, many countries, including the United States, actively employ these weapons. While the U.S. has been pushing for precision munitions since the latter half of the 20th century, U.S. military officials understand the need that, given the right circumstances, sometimes a sledgehammer is better than a needle. And when the U.S. needs that sledgehammer, both air and ground units have several thermobaric weapons to choose from. While the Navy and Marine Corps have developed thermobaric warheads for existing weapon systems in the Hellfire and shoulder-launched multi-purpose weapon systems respectively, there has only been one purpose-built thermobaric weapon built since the Persian Gulf War. Called the BLU-118 bomb, it's based on the old napalm canisters of the Vietnam War. These repurposed munitions came to life after the War on Terror started and there arose a need to destroy terrorist hideouts deep inside caves. Air Force researchers developed a thermobaric munition with a delayed fuse that would allow pilots to skip the bomb inside a cave tunnel, which would then go off once deep inside. Initial testing in Nevada proved how powerful this weapon could be and it made its combat debut in 2002 when the U.S. Air Force's F-15s destroyed an Al-Qaeda cave complex in Afghanistan. While the United States possesses a variety of thermobaric munitions, it does so in very limited quantities and uses them only when absolutely necessary. In fact, using such munitions on the battlefield often requires the highest levels of authorization to ensure no civilians are hurt. That is not the case with Russia. Ever since the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, the Russians have gleefully embraced thermobaric weapons as a mainstay in their military. Beginning with the one that started it all is the TOS-1. 
The TOS-1 is built upon a T-72 chassis and fires thermobaric warheads that have an effective range of several kilometers. Its unique look of having a 24 rocket launcher atop its chassis gives it away. All told, about 50 of these vehicles have been made for Russia, with numerous countries receiving export models, including Iraq, Syria, Azerbaijan, and Algeria. However, the Russian military loves their TOS vehicles and created a manned portable system called the RPPO Schmel, or Bumblebee. Created around the same time as the TOS-1, the Schmel is a manned portable system with a rocket designed to have the same explosive effect as a 155mm artillery shell. With an average range of several hundred meters, this disposable system has become a mainstay in small unit firepower in the Russian military. In fact, it has seen prolific use in Afghanistan, both Chechen wars, Georgia, and the war in Ukraine since 2014. The Russians have developed a wide assortment of aerial drop thermobaric bombs, and one of the most prolific is known as the ODAB-500. In service since at least the 1990s, the ODAB-500 has been used extensively throughout the Chechen wars and in the Ukraine. It is Russia's weapon of choice to terrorize villains, and Russian aircraft regularly carry out strikes against Ukraine civilians using this weapon due to its ability to penetrate air raid shelters. Thankfully for Ukraine, their military also has a way to use thermobaric weapons. Known as the RGT-27S grenades, these thermobaric hand grenades have a little-known history. However, it's known that Ukraine has been using these grenades by dropping them from drones on top of Russian armored vehicles with devastating effects. But how did thermobaric technology develop from huge missiles with a limited range to being able to fit in the palm of a soldier's hand? The origin story of thermobaric weapons is fraught with mystery. Many claim that the Germans experimented with and even developed some rudimentary thermobaric armaments during World War II. However, that's all it is, just claims. Beyond the few photographs of unknown equipment and some secondhand accounts, little physical evidence and primary source material suggests the Germans produced a working prototype, much less a functional thermobaric weapon system. The first actual thermobaric weapon developed that can be proven was by the United States during the tail end of the Vietnam War. Known as the CBU-55, these thermobaric weapons were meant to solve the problem of destroying NVA and Viet Cong tunnel complexes when even B-52 Arc Light missions could not. The Air Force used them in small combat test runs in late 1971 and 1972. The initial combat trials were quite promising, and full-scale production would have continued had it not been for the U.S. withdrawing combat forces in 1973. The Russians are a different story. The Soviet Union developed thermobaric weapons independently about seven years after the U.S. did. By 1987, the first purported use of TOS-1 vehicles occurred in Afghanistan, and the Schmel also came online during this time. After the successful use of these weapons in Afghanistan, the USSR and then Russia began developing more and more types of thermobaric weapons than anyone else. They did this to compensate for the lack of professionally trained and motivated combat infantry in the Russian armed forces. By utilizing overwhelming firepower, it was hoped that these munitions could annihilate enemy hardpoints with unmotivated combat infantry sweeping over to mop up the survivors. It was this strategy that the Russians adopted in Chechnya but have not adopted in Ukraine due to Russian aircraft being scared to get shot down near enemy formations and the Ukraines having superior counter-battery technologies that make firing a TOS system an almost instant death sentence. But unfortunately for Russian servicemen, Putin claims to have a weapon that can destroy cities during his special military operation without endangering crew members. Known as the father of all bombs, in a jab against the very real and combat-tested American mother of all bombs, the father of all bombs is an experimental thermobaric weapon that Putin and his cronies claim has a yield of 44 tons. Such a massive yield would be four times greater than the American mother of all bombs and on par with the higher-end tactical nuclear weapons. The only problem is it's all a lie. Footage from that time does show an impressive fireball and an explosive device being dropped out of a Tu-160 heavy bomber. 
These features were characteristic of the infamous Tsar Bomba testing, where the bomber was heavily modified and bomb bay doors were removed. However, the Russians claimed that through the use of nanotechnology and other secret science, the father of all bombs produces a heat and pressure wave twice as great as the American version at just half the weight. Of course, there have been no further known tests of this weapon. And given the Russians' need for better weapons in Ukraine, if they had it or it actually worked, it almost certainly would have been used on the battlefield by this point. Bye for now.